It's Wednesday, and that means time for the Prospect Team of the Week. We have a repeat at catcher, yet another Reds infielder making this list, and multiple outfield options from both the Astros and the Phillies. Let's talk about it. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked on MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, freelance baseball writer and podcaster. Thank you for making this your first listen every single day. We're probably part of the Locked on Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. And today's episode is made possible by our friends at eBay Motors. A championship team is about each player being a perfect fit. It's the same with your vehicle. So for parts that fit, head to ebaymotors.com. Look for the green check mark with eBay's guaranteed fit ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions do apply. So, prospect team of the week. The guys that performed the best last week in the minor leagues. We're going to start off at pitcher with a name that you undoubtedly have heard of. You are aware of who this guy is, but Marlins right-hand pitcher Yuri Perez, pitching for double-A Pensacola, goes up two starts against the Mississippi Braves, and, uh, yeah, went pretty well. 11 innings pitched combined between the two outings. Four hits, two runs, three walks to 20 strikeouts. Again, 11 innings, 20 strikeouts. Uh, and the story here on Yuri Perez is he's in double A now. This is the second year that he's been in double A. Uh, he spent most of the year last year there. He got injured a little bit and missed a little bit of time. Uh, but I absolutely think that he's a prime candidate to get called up to AAA soon. 2019 IFA, and in AA last year, 17 games, because again, he missed some time. I believe it was with a lat strain. So, yeah, strained lat muscle. So, in those 17 starts last year, 408 ERA and 75 innings pitched, 106 strikeouts, so 12.7 per nine, to 25 walks, three walks per nine, nine home runs allowed. This year, going back to Double A Pensacola, uh, six starts, two three two ERA brings the ERA down by by one point seven. Thirty one innings pitched, forty two strikeouts, so twelve point two per nine, rather close to last year. To nine walks, two point six per nine, close to last year but better. Five home runs allowed, and the arsenal for Yuri Perez is unusual from the fact that it what package it comes out of, right? So. Uh, fastball is a 70-grade fastball, sits in the mid-90s. He can touch 100 with it. And he got really good last year at learning to command it up in the zone. It's got a lot of great ride on it. And so they specifically had him focus on elevating that fastball. You know, when you throw it up in the zone like that, it makes it harder for pitchers to hit, for hitters to hit it because they're expecting it to drop more than it does. To pair off of that, he added a slider last year. Uh, more of a traditional slider than a, a gyro or a sweeper or whatever. But I think it's a plus pitch since in the mid-80s. It's probably the best of his secondary pitches right now. Uh, to go along with that, he's got a change-up. Correction. Change-up is the best secondary pitch. Uh, slider's the best breaking pitch. But change-up, fantastic weapon against lefties. A lot of late run there. Uh, it's probably, it's not quite a 70 grade. It's right below that. So I guess 65 if we're doing half grades here. Uh, also has a spike curveball, above average pitch, some two-plane break to it. Just a lot of really great weapons as far as the fastball staying up in the zone. Ex extraordinary amount of ride. Uh, you have the changeup running one way. You have the slider. You have the spike curveball. Lots of different stuff. And it comes out of a package of a guy that's six foot eight. So it's really unusual angle coming in. Helps the breaking stuff play up, especially when it breaks down and away. Uh, if you're a lefty, it's breaking in on your feet. The changeup is really useful against them. If you're a righty, it's just darting away from you, down and, uh, down and out away from you as it gets to the plate. Makes it really tough to kind of deal with there. Big fan of Yuri Perez. All really, really looked at Kumar Rocker. We've had him on this team before. Uh, in high A against Jersey Shore, started a game. Six innings, one hit, no runs, two walks, eight strikeouts. Uh, went with Perez because the level of difficulty is a little bit higher. I ultimately feel like Rocker is going to be promoted sooner rather than later. Kind of wild to think about that, but I think 
they were a little more cautious with him because he didn't have a full year of pitching last year, and they were a little bit burned by the Jack Leiter going to double A and struggling all year. And I really, I really think that Kumar Rocker probably by midseason is looking at a bump up to double A Frisco. For the left-hand pitcher on the prospect team of the week, we went with Joey Cantillo of the Cleveland Guardians. Sitting in double A, was a 2017 uh, 16th rounder out of high school. So absolutely just kind of wild. Was uh, drafted by the, the Padres and then was part of the return in 2020 for Mike Clevenger in the Mike Clevenger deal. May end up being the best piece of that deal. Who knows? But uh, in part of the issue was 2021, he didn't throw a lot. He had an oblique injury, only got 13 innings, and then last year was in double-A Akron, but his year got cut off at midseason because of a shoulder injury. So we just haven't seen him a lot recently. In those 13 starts in double-A last year before he got hurt, 193 ERA in 60 and two-thirds innings, 87 strikeouts, so 12.9 per nine, to 28 walks, 4.15 per nine, and two home runs allowed. And if you thought that was good, now it's a great stat line for last year, but if you thought that was good, so far this year, going back to AA Akron with the Rubber Ducks, four games, 0.55 ERA in 16 and a third innings, 25 strikeouts, so 13.8 per nine. He raised the strikeouts by a full, uh, a full strikeout per nine to eight walks, 4.4 per nine. A little bit higher, but right around the same amount, no home runs allowed. And the reason he gets this is he had a start against Portland. Uh, five innings, one hit, no runs, two walks, 13 strikeouts. An absurd 43% CSW. Tons of swings and misses. And it's something where the fastball has gotten a lot better than it used to be. He averages 92 with it. He can run it up to 97, which again, for a lefty, is fantastic velocity because lefties usually sit a little bit slower. And then to go along with it, uh, he's got a he's got a changeup plus pitch, easily plus pitch, as well as a slider and a curveball. The main bread and butter is the fastball changeup combo. Uh, he's got controls average. I mean, he walked four guys per nine last year. He's walking four guys per nine this year. But the fastball changeup play up really well because he's six four and he throws from a high three-quarter slot. So the angle's a little bit tougher like as a lefty. So he's a tall lefty that has a high release point. The angle's really tough for guys to, to pick it up, and then the extension's really good. So it play, the fastball plays up off that 92 miles an hour, and then the, the changeup does things you weren't expecting. Again, curveball, slider, they're there. They're not amazing, but Joey Cantillo looked amazing, and it feels like he's a guy, one, if he's available in your dynasty league, maybe go grab him. Uh, some of the issues you've seen, the you know, the Guardians always have great pitching, but there is a good chance, Tanner Bibby's already up, there's a good chance you could see Joey Cantillo by the end of the year, or he could be a trade piece if other teams are looking for uh, pitching prospects who could reach the bigs this year. In just a minute. I want to talk about some of the infield position players. We've got a repeat here. We've got yet another Cincinnati infielder. And we have uh, a Boston shortstop to talk about. And yes, it's the one you're expecting, but also no, it's not the one you're expecting. And I'll explain what that means in just a minute. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends with So Rare. I, I'm glad they sponsored the show. I love this game so much. It's a revolutionary fantasy baseball game where uh, fans become... Owners, you have officially licensed digital cards featuring players from across all 30 teams. And unlike a lot of other uh, fantasy baseball platforms, you own this experience, right? So these cards are yours to own. You can collect them, you can buy them, you can sell them, you compete with your cards against other opponents. The better you finish, the better the rewards are for you. You can get po uh, powerful cards, you can get great rewards. I've seen game tickets, I've seen signed merchandise, I've seen unique and rare cards, all kind of things like that. It's a three or four day uh, game week, depending on if it's Monday through Thursday or Friday through Sunday. You pick a, you start off with your free team of player cards. Every time you compete, you earn another card to add to your collection. Every day, every 24 hours, you can swap out a card in your collection for a different card if you want to try to get better players. Uh, and then when, when you pick your eight-person team, 
starting pitcher, relief pitcher, corner infielder, middle infielder, outfielder, extra hitter, and a flex. You pick your team, you get points, positive or negative, depending on their performance. And again, the better you come in on the, on the leaderboards, the better rewards you get. So head to SoRare.com slash locked on. That's S-O-R-A-R-E dot com slash locked on to draft your team of free player cards, set your lineup, and start competing today to win epic rewards. Again, that's SoRare.com slash locked on MLB to start competing today. Okay, looking at the infield on the prospect team of the week, uh, a guy that is on there for the second straight week is Dylan Dingler of the the Detroit Tigers. And you'll remember last week when I had him on there, I mentioned a little bit that it was technically a rehab appearance. And so he was better than the A team that he, than the A ball team he was playing against. Well, he did it again, but this time he did it against the appropriate level of competition. He did it instead of low A, he did it in double A. So five games, started three at catcher, two at DH, nine at 18, two home runs, Two doubles, scored four runs, had nine RBIs, four walks to five strikeouts, and one for one on stolen bases. And the thing that we talked about is he was a defensive first catcher when he was drafted in the second round of the 2020 draft, was seen as the best defensive catcher in the draft. And at the time, his hit tool was graded out at like a 30. And it was because of his swing. Something where he's got good raw power, probably above average, but he had a big, long swing with a bunch of holes in it. He's done the work to shorten the swing. He's tried to close some of those holes. He's not all the way there. He still strikes out a lot. You know, you look at what he did last year. He had 107 games in AA Erie. He struck out 143 times. So the hit tool is still not where it needs to be, but it is significantly better, and he's able to make quality contact. You see him on the list for the second straight week. So impressed with Dylan Dingler and what he's been able to do. Also was considering Hunter Goodman in this spot, another repeat guy. He only started one game at catcher, though, last week. He played in all six, three DH, one catcher, one left field, one first base. Had to give it to Dylan Dingler. Speaking of first base, uh, at first base, we gave it to Logan Davidson of the Oakland A's. 2019 first rounder out of Clemson. And has fallen off prospect lists because he's spending his third straight year at double-A Midland. So he is 25 years old this year in double-A, and the stats have been remarkably similar from year to year to year. Uh, Slash line in 2021, uh, 212, 307, 312. 2022, 252, so 40 points better in batting average. Uh, 337 on base, 30 points better in on base. 406 slugging, so 80 to 90 points better in slugging. That was the only significant difference between the slash lines. Uh, this year in Midland, 264, 338, 431. So incremental improvement again. Uh, but it's something where he started off as, I think he was he was either in college or he was drafted as a shortstop. Ended up moving to, he played three games at first base and a game at third base, and he's kind of seen as one of those super utility guys that can play uh, can play third, can play first, could probably get by a little bit of corner outfield, things like that. Uh, the issue I think he has, the power's above average. The hit tool, I wouldn't say it's as bad as I it, I wouldn't say it's as bad as some places had it marked. I'd probably put it as a 40 now. But his issue is he might need to stop switch hitting. 105, 191, 263 slash line as a right-handed batter last year. Maybe just stick to hitting lefty. I think that's probably the best way to do this. Second baseman on the team, another Cincinnati Red. We had one last week. We had we had two last week. We had one the week before. Matt McClain was the guy this week. Played in six games, 11 to 25. This is all in AAA, by the way. 11 to 25, two hits, four doubles, a triple, and that triple came in a game where he hit for the cycle. Uh, five runs, 11 RBIs, two walks, two three strikeouts, and one for one on stolen bases. Played three games at second and three games at short last week. And we talked about at UCLA, he played a lot of center field as well. So he could be a second base, shortstop, center field kind of utility guy. I think that's probably his best path to everyday playing time in Cincinnati, is roaming around a lot of different places. We've seen guys... They have a ton of middle infielders there. We've seen some guys move around. We've seen Noelby Marte kind of settle in at third. Uh, we've seen Elidio Cruz still playing short. 
something where Matt McClain kicked into second, but again, he can still play short. He can play, I think he can play some more outfield, and he might get to the bigs faster if he went ahead and moved to center field. At shortstop, the guy on the team is Marcelo Meyer. Uh, so last, last week, 16 of 31, three home runs, six doubles, eight runs, and 12 RBIs, no walks to four strikeouts, and one for one on stolen bases. Uh, he is obviously very good, befitting his draft stock, befitting his prospect ranking where everybody thinks he should be. But the reason I wanted to make an exception and talk about somebody else is he's in high A. Uh, he's 20 years old in high A. A lot of Boston fans are clamoring for a shortstop because of the issues you've had at the major league level with Trevor Story being out because of the internal brace procedure. And so instead, and a guy who was considered for the shortstop spot on this team, I want to talk about David Hamilton. Okay? So David Hamilton, 2019 eighth rounder by the Brewers, was moved in the Hunter Renfro deal. Uh, the thing here, 28 games in AAA this year, 311, 398, 557. Six home runs, 13 extra base hits, 15 walks to 21 strikeouts, and 20 of 24 on stolen bases. Uh, again, in 28 games. Last week, 9 of 21, two home runs, two doubles, scored nine runs, had four RBIs, six walks to three strikeouts, and six of seven on stolen bases. He's doing all this in AAA. And so I think David Hamilton, he's got fantastic speed. He's got great lateral agility. He is a true shortstop, but he can play multiple positions. I really think he's a more likely candidate, significantly more likely candidate to be able to come up and help the Red Sox this year than taking a very young Marcelo Meyer, who's 20 years old in high A and moving him from Greenville to Boston. So I know Boston fans want better performance at shortstop. I think if you are going to get it, you're going to get it from David Hamilton, not from Marcelo Meyer. But if you need shortstop in Dynasty and Fantasy, you may want to think about going to see, maybe add him to your watch list. If anybody has David Hamil doesn't have David Hamilton, go out and make a note about him. The third baseman on this team, Michael Curiali of the St. Louis Cardinals, 2022 12th rounder out of UCLA, and had a fantastic week last week. He's playing in, 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 uh, in Low A Palm Beach. So six games, five of them at third base, he DH'd once, but... 12 of 17, three doubles, a triple, nine runs, four RBIs, nine walks to five strikeouts, and one for two on stolen bases. Uh, Michael Curiali, and if I'm pronouncing that wrong, please let me know if you're on YouTube. Drop it in the comments. Um, also, if you're on YouTube, apologize for the, for the poor quality. I'm in a hotel traveling. This is the best we can do. Um, if you are, you know, on audio or whatever, you can tweet at me or drop it in our Discord. But he is, Michael Curiali is destroying in Palm Beach. He is absolutely killing people. He needs to get moved to high A. He does. Uh, his slash line in 26 games in Palm Beach right now, 405, 541, 619 with 14 extra base hits. Now, only one of those is a home run. He's got 11 doubles, two triples, and a home run. Uh, and he's walked 21 times to 24 strikeouts in 26 games. And he's 3 of 7 on stolen bases. So he's not perfect. He is still striking out, again, almost once a game. But he's walking just about as much as he's striking out. Uh, he's below 50% on steals. And he's not hitting for a bunch of power. But other than that, he's doing everything you need him to do. And it really feels like you need to get him, one, away from automated balls and strikes. And two, you need to get him into a more age-appropriate competition level. He is 22 years old. He got a little bit of time in low-A Palm Beach after the draft last year. I want to say, let's say like 20 games. He batted 231, 342, 292. So I understand why they put him back in Palm Beach. But you're at the point he needs to move on to high-A. In just a minute, we've got outfielders and multiple options from both the Astros and the Phillies, and we'll get to that next right here on Locked on MLB Prospects. Okay, so looking at 
uh, outfielders on this team. The first guy is the only guy that wasn't either in the Phillies organization or the Astros organization, but we have Jordan Beck of the Colorado Rockies. Uh, and this is where it's going to start to get really funny. 2022 first-rounder supplemental out of the University of Tennessee. Remember that. That's going to come up again in a few minutes. Uh, 21 games this year so far in high A. 286, 322, 595. Seven home runs, 12 extra base hits, five walks to 19 strikeouts, and one for one on stolen bases. Uh, defensively, above average in a corner. He's got above average arm, above average speed. Probably doesn't have the reads, routes, reactions to play center field, but can handle a corner just fine. The power is seen as plus. The issue going into the year was, say it with me, your power tool is only as good as your hit tool. It's If you've listened to the everydayers have heard that a million times, and I've had people ask to put that on t-shirts. Uh, it's something where the swing, and he, you saw this come up with him last year as he got into SEC play. He batted under 250 in SEC play. It's a really handsy swing. So it's, it's, he's not biomechanically uh, using everything. It's a lot of hands and wrists. And it's like an incredibly steep uphill swing. And so when he makes contact, it's suboptimal. He's knocking it into the ground. Or, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry he's, he's popping it up. Or he's hitting fly balls, but he didn't quite get all of it. So it's not going out. Uh, because of the swing, the way the swing works, uh, he can't really hit pitches on the inner half that well. So something he's been working to shorten that swing up. And then pitch recognition-wise, he struck he's struggled with spin. So this is something where I'm assuming and I'm hoping that he's he's doing that work to fix that. Uh, the numbers look so far like he's fixing a lot of this stuff. 11 of 25 in the six games he played last week. Three were in left, two were in right. He DH one time. Again, not a not a middle, not a center fielder, just a corner outfielder. 11 to 25, four home runs, two doubles. Six runs to 12 RBIs, one walk to four strikeouts. So it looks like he's doing a better job of making optimal contact, maybe not having as steep of a swing, so that he can barrel it versus popping it up. Because, again, the barrel is your hard hit rate, uh, is a hard hit ball at an optimal angle. And when you see a significant discrepancy in the hard hit rate and the barrel percentage, like one's above average and one below, one's below average, that's usually an indicator of, of a launch angle issue or the plane of the swing. So thing to fix for Jordan Beck. Looks like he's already started some of that. Next thing is going to be the pitch recognition on spin, especially away. Uh, the second guy on this list, the reason I said to remember University of Tennessee, is outfielder Drew Gilbert of the Houston Astros. 2022 first rounder out of the University of Tennessee. Uh, so they had a great team last year. But... Uh, 21 games so far this year in high A, and he's killing it. 360, 421, 686. Six home runs, 15 extra base hits, six walks to 21 strikeouts, again in 21 games, so right on the level of being too much. Uh, and four for four on stolen bases. His performance last week, 10 to 22 in the five games he played. I think all but one were in center field, maybe? But anyway, 10 to 22, three home runs, three triples. Six runs, 10 RBIs, no walks to eight strikeouts, and one for one on stolen bases. Blazing speed. Uh, I mean, above somewhere between above average and plus. The arm is plus. The defense is at least above average, if not plus. Uh, he's, a sh he's a short king, 5'9", 185. So he's probably a little bit maxed out physical development-wise, but he uses every bit of it that he can. He's, in, he's very aggressive at the plate, just on the borderline of being too aggressive, right? Like he's just barely on the good side of aggressive versus the bad side of aggressive. Fine line to walk. And something a lot of those short kings seem to do pretty well is be per, is be super aggressive, but in a good way. Uh, the power, again, because of the physical limitations, only caps out at average to maybe above average, but he taps into it on the pole side really well. So very impressed with how I see that. And then he's really good at optimizing contact because he's got very good pitch recognition. So when he when he recognizes a ball that he can put a barrel on instead of just making contact with, he swings and he puts a barrel on it. So a very, very good week for Drew Gilbert last week. Again, 10 to 22, six extra base hits. Um, runner up on this, the other Houston guy that I looked at for this was Justin Durden. Played in five games, four in center, one in right. I believe he's in AAA at Sugarland. Uh, 
That whole Sugar Land team had a great week last week. Uh, 13 to 26 in those five games for Justin Durden. Four home runs, four doubles, and a triple. So nine of the 13 hits are for extra bases. Uh, seven runs, 15 RBIs, one walk to nine strikeouts. I actually think MLB Pipeline had him instead of Gilbert on their team of the week. So there you go. Drew, Drew Gilbert did just get promoted uh, just the other day. So he's been moved up in difficulty level because he did so well. Uh, last spot on the team for the outfield came down to two Phillies prospects. Uh, the first one was Johan Rojas. Uh, played in six games, 14-27, to 27, a home run, a double, a triple, 10 runs, six RBIs, three walks to three strikeouts, two for three on stolen bases. Played five games in center and DH'd one time. Tons of respect to the dudes that can play five or six games in center field a week. It's a lot of use on your legs. I ultimately went with Ethan Wilson. Uh, got in five games in double-A Reading, 12-25, three home runs and three doubles, Seven runs, 11 RBIs, one walk to five strikeouts, and one for one on stolen bases. Played, again, five of the six games, two in right, two in left, dh one time. Uh, 2021 second rounder out of South Alabama. And the thing for Ethan Wilson is he was drafted for the offense and really didn't have a great year last year. Was split between uh, high A and double A. 130 games, slash line of 235, 290, 336. Eight home runs, 32 extra base hits, 33 walks to 114 strikeouts in 130 games, and 26 of 35 on stolen bases. You can see, uh, despite the speed being average, maybe above average, he can optimize when he goes, but it's not perfect. A good throw can get him, 26 of 35 last year. He's doing better this year in just about every single category, and significantly better in every single category. Now, small sample size, I'll admit, but last week, five games, 12 to 25, three home runs, three doubles, seven runs, 11 RBIs, one walk to five strikeouts, one for one on stolen bases. I think I already did that, did that but 14 games this season in AA Reading, 377, 417, 774 slugging, five home runs, where, again, he hit eight in 130 last year. Five home runs in those 14 games for Ethan Wilson. Ten extra base hits, four walks to nine strikeouts, and one for one on stolen bases. The thing here, power was above average. He was bad about chasing. And what ended up happening was his max exit velo is great because he has good power, but his average exit velo was below 90 miles an hour, like 86 miles an hour, because he was making a lot of suboptimal contact. He had a high ground ball rate, had a lot of swing and miss in there. And so it's been a lot of work on uh, recognizing pitches better out of the hand, understanding the strike zone better, so having a better feeling about that's not going to touch the corner or that is going to touch the corner or that is going to be a, a drivable pitch and that is not. And so swing decisions and pitch recognition. Uh, the swing itself, for the most part, is fine, right? Like he has good contact ability and the swing is an optimal swing, it was the decision-making. So a lot of work there to fix that for Ethan Wilson. You can see it paying off. I expect him to spend a good portion of the year in AA, but if he's putting up numbers like this, he'll be in AAA sooner rather than later. Reminder, Monday is a, Monday's show is a mailbag. If you have questions for the show, I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. Show's on Twitter at Locked On Farm. You can email us, LockedOnMLBProspects at gmail.com, or drop your questions in a Locked MLB Prospects Discord. Links in the episode, link is in the episode description. Links in the show notes. Until tomorrow's show, remember, it's always a great time to pay a minor leaguer. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.